There is a particular kind of question that all human beings seek to answer. And that question is called an existential question. All philosophers, all scholars, and all religions have tried to answer this question. And the question is very simple. It's a question of the great mystery. Who are we? How did we come here? And why are we here on earth as human beings? Or in a more sophisticated way, what is the cause of our existence and what is the purpose of our existence? These are existential questions. Nearly 2,400 years ago, this famous uh, Greek philosopher called Plato, I think referred to in Islamic tradition as Aflatun, came up with a metaphor called the metaphor, the allegory of the cave. And in that metaphor, he basically says, imagine a cave in which people are all sitting together, but they are, their heads are fixed so they can only see on the wall in front of the cave. There is a fire behind them which they can't turn and see, so they know that there is a source of light behind them. And all they see on the wall in front are shadows, what Plato calls as appearances. So for Plato, for these people, Plato argues that those appearances and those shadows are reality. If they turned and looked at the fire, then they would realize that, oh my God, this fire is creating these shadows. So these are not, this is not reality, but this is shadow. But then there is also a hole in the cave from which real light comes in. I don't want to talk much about Plato, but this is important, so I'm going to take one more minute. So Plato argues that what if one of us escapes those bindings and not only sees the fire, but actually goes outside the cave and sees the sunlight. Now what is going to happen when you step out of the cave is you're going to be exposed to this dazzling light and you probably will not be able to see for a little while as to what is going on. This dazzling light will shatter you. Eventually you will adjust to it if you are exposed to it for an extended period of time but briefly you will not be so. And then he says this is the philosopher who is enlightened because now he's seen the true light and so he comes back in the cave and he's trying to explain to the ordinary people that look, this is not reality and this is not real light. But I want to turn that experiment of Plato on its head and tell you that that sunlight, that light, that light inside the cave is like a reason, it's like our akhal. So if you're stuck in the cave, you think your akhal is sufficient and what you see is just shadows and you think this is true, this is the proof of science, this is the proof of reason. Maybe a philosopher can use the same light to escape the cave. But revelation and prophecies are essentially the light coming into the cave. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends an angel into the cave, literally into the cave, the warahira where Prophet is there to tell him. So the light has come into the cave directly. So it is a very interesting metaphor. You move from Plato's cave to the cave of Prophet and realize that the Prophet has not stepped out of the cave, but revelation in the form of light has come into the cave. And so now he knows the truth. So this is a very common thing. So what has happened in both cases, whether the philosopher goes out of the cave, or the revelation comes into the cave, this is mirage. This is ascension. Both the philosopher and the prophet have risen or gone beyond our common existence. 
the parameters of our normal existence and discover what is the truth. They have not only discovered what is the truth, but they have yaqeen. They have ainal yaqeen. They have seen it. So that is an important part. So once I started researching for today, I discovered to my great chagrin that it's a very common theme in nearly all religions. For example, Jewish rabbis claim that not only did Musa salam have a miraj, on the basis of that miraj, which is also described in the Quran, that he goes on the mountain, but he goes on the top of the mountain. From there he rises to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's given the entire Torah in one shot. And he comes back with it. This is his miraj. And I also found something very interesting. I found a rabbi arguing about the miraj of Ibrahim al-Islam. And in his argument, in trying to prove that Ibrahim al-Islam indeed went up and had, he actually cites an ayah from the Quran as proof of the miraj of Ibrahim al -Islam. And the ayah of, uh, that he cites is from Surah Al-An'am, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa kazalik nuriya Ibrahim malakuta stamawati wal ard, wa li yakunu min al-mukhineen. He says, this is very interesting, he said, thus we show to Abraham uh, the realms of the heaven and the earth so that he may have yaqeen. So if you just take this meaning of the ayah in the Quran, it very clearly says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown the heavens and the earth to Ibrahim al-Islam so that he has ainul yaqeen. So it is very interesting that the miraj of Ibrahim al-Islam, which Jews also claim, are actually proving it from the Quran. They find proof more in the Quran than the first and the second testament for it. The Bible has the miraj of Paul in Corinthians. He says very clearly, I was snatched into third heaven. He uses the word third heaven. So he was directly snatched into the third heaven. And there are many, in fact, there are many Christians who have claimed Miraj going up into the heaven, seeing the hell and heaven, etc. In fact, Muslim scholars argue that some of the weak hadiths in our tradition, which describe heaven and hell, are basically Israeliya, which means that they have been taken from the Jewish and Christian traditions and been brought into our tradition because some of the Sahih hadiths, which are there in Bukhari and Muslim, do not account, give you detailed accounts of hell and heaven. So that is an important part. Even the Zoroastrians have Miraj. The Hindus have the Hindus have a mythological character called the Narad Muni. And when I read about him, it seems as if he is, he has frequent flyer miles. He goes so often up and down that he has accumulated frequent flyer miles between <coughs> heaven and the earth. He's a manipulative figure. He's not uh, revered in Hindu tradition. They actually mock him, but he keeps traveling all the time. So. So when we talk about miraj in the life of Prophet Sallallahu we must understand that this is, a, this is the sunnah of all the religions, all, all major religions. Shamanism is actually based on all individual mirages. So there is a lot of narrative of different mirages in different traditions. So when we talk, especially for those of us who live in America with our children who all want to be scientists, you know, I sometimes jokingly say that South Asians are born pre-med. So yes. You should not hesitate to tell these kids about the night of Miraj because it sounds miraculous or it sounds unscientific. All traditions have fell. Whether it's true or not, there is this desire for yaqeen. There is a desire for proof and proof in this life that there is a God, that there is a heaven, <coughs> there is a hell. And the Miraj is the answer to all these desires for yaqeen. In the Islamic tradition, we have many parallel trends which tell the story of Miraj. There are, I want to categorize them as three broad traditions, three highways. One is the Shia narrative of the Miraj, then the Sunni narrative, and the Sufi narrative. Uh, I'm going to stay in the middle. So for this lecture, Given the fact that this is the first time, I don't know what is the extent of knowledge of Miraj and its history in this audience. So this is going to be a lecture which is Miraj 101 at the basic level. Primarily because I think I am only in Miraj 102 level, so, so I can't go beyond what I know.
But I, let me tell you this much. I'm going to stick only to actually Salafi scholars, biographies, Salafi scholars, tafsir. So I'm using only Ibn Kasir's tafsir of the ayahs that I'm citing. I'm looking at only uh, Qadi Ayyad's uh, as Shifa as the biography of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the ahadith that I will quote, except one, all are from these just three, Bukhari, Muslim, and Tirmini. Except one hadith, whose Islam is weak, and I will tell you which hadith it is. It is a very well-known hadith, but it's, it's Islam is weak. Uh, just because the Islam is weak does not necessarily mean that the hadith is wrong. It just means that we can't prove the chain. The chain is weak. The contents may be true or false. So let's talk about this wonderful night of Miraj. One thing that cannot be contested is the fact, is the reality of Miraj because it's in the Quran. So if you are a believing Muslim and you accept the reality of the Quran as an authentic document whose every verse is the literal word of God and you don't question the authenticity of the Quran, then you cannot question the authenticity of Miraj. It's a tragedy that in the life of Prophet there were many people who questioned this story and even today there are many people who question Miraj and his commemoration, etc. So Surah Al-Isra, which is also sometimes referred to as Surah Al-Bani Israel, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Subhana Allahi Asra bi Abdihi Laila." Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in this one ayah is talking about three journeys, three journeys, horizontal, vertical, and then spiritual. So he's talking about from Bayt Al-Haram to Bayt Al-Maqdis to Bayt Al-Mamur and beyond. So you have one from Bayt Al-Haram to Bayt al maqdis second from Bayt al maqdis to Bayt Al-Mamur. The second journey is the Miraj. The first journey is Isra. Isra is the horizontal travel. Miraj means ascension. I think the linguistic meaning of the term Miraj is status, elevator. Like Scotty beat me up from Star Trek, it's like that. Beat me up. That's Miraj. And that goes up to Baitul Mahmud. And beyond that, there are, we don't have the vocabulary to describe the journey beyond Baitul Mahmud. That's why there are so few ahadis, so few traditions about what happened afterwards. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Subhanallah aswa bi abdihi layla. Praise is he who has taken his servant in a night journey. All traditional scholars say it is very interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not praising the servant who has traveled. So when we say this miraj is the journey of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa actually it's the other way around. This is Allah's miracle. It is Allah who did it. And he is praising himself because of the miraculous nature of the journey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, praised is he, exalted is he, sublime is he, who took his servant in one night, Layla min al-Masjid al-Haram ila al-Masjid al-Aqsa al-Ladhi barakna hawla. That he took him to Masjid al-Aqsa, the far mosque. Now, the far mosque could mean anything. And the way we are able to identify that it is Jerusalem is because of this part of the ayah which says, Alladhi barakna hawlahu, the neighborhood of which we have blessed. So basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I have taken you to that distant mosque which is in the Holy Land. There are some people who say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the entire earth holy, which is true, we will talk about it today. And so there is no Baitul Mahdas or Makhan al Mahdas or Mintakar Mahdas. There is no area which is holy, which is wrong. This ayah tells you. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He has made the neighborhood or the area around Masjid al-Aqsa as blessed barak now we have and it is His testimony so we can't question the holiness of that man and He has said it repeatedly in other scriptures too. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says how لِنُورِ min al ayatina and He's explaining why He has done this. He said I'm taking Him there to show Him my signs to show him my signs. And that is the reference to Miraj. Taking him from him, from Haram to Aqdas is is Isra. And then to show him my signs is uh, is about Miraj. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, Huwa as al basir He is all hearing and he is all seeing. And the reason why he is invoking these two attributes of himself is because he is actually legitimizing the conversation he had with Rasulullah sallallahu And he is also legitimizing everything that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam claims he saw on this journey. That's why he's invoking these two attributes. Uh, if they're not random, every time when you hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raising his attributes in ayah, don't assume that they are just random. There is a particular reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invokes a particular attribute of his. And in this ayah when he says that he is a Samir al-Basir, he's trying to say, look, I hear everything so I know what Muhammad heard, no one else may know it. And I know what my servant has seen on that day and I am testifying to the fact that he did. So how does this go? Very briefly, the Sufis narrations more or less follow the traditional orthodox. So they use ahadis. But as I will explain to you, even the orthodox tradition has two versions of this. One is often attributed to Aisha or Umul Mumini her version of what happened, and the other is Ibn Abbas's version, and all Sufis follow Ibn Abbas's version. I am also partial to Ibn Abbas's version, and I'll tell you why I'm partial to that. But lots of other Sufis, apparently they themselves had their own mirages, so they're more busy talking about their own mirages. I had this mystical experience. Actually. The only good thing is that they don't claim actually going up physically, all of them have had their Mirages in their dreams. So, so a lot of Muslims, a lot of Christians, and lots of Jews, and lots of other people claim this mystical experience, but only in the dream form. With the Shia, I started reading them and then I stopped. Maybe I picked the wrong tradition, but I'll just tell you why I stopped reading because it seems to me that the Shia traditions are trying to use the Miraj to argue that the whole purpose of Miraj was to tell Prophet. Sallallahu that Hadrat Ali is his successor. So like for example, one tradition I read in which Jibril asks uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi where is Ali? And he says, oh, I left him behind as my Khalifa while I'm away in traveling. And uh, he said, well, we should bring him here. And they bring him right away. And then they are both taken together. So the rest of the Mirage is together. And the Shia explained that there were 120 mirages. The Prophet didn't go up once, he went 120 times, which is 10 times per imam, and so it is. So, uh, we, we have grown up in a Sunni universe, so these traditions seem... So I stopped reading them, but I thought if, you, if somebody is interested, they should know. So now let me come back to what we do. The most authoritative tradition is Malik bin Anas bin Malik's tradition, which is very commonly said it is there. The, the whole one is in Muslim, part of it is available in Bukhari. So what does he say? The, but before that, let me tell you that there are two or three controversies even among the Sahaba and among traditional Muslim scholars about Mirai. The first controversy is whether he actually went physically or in spirit or in dream sequence. So the question is, did he physically go? And in that, the Sahaba had three positions. And those three positions are, the one position is that he slept and he dreamed the whole thing. So he, the entire Mirage is a dream sequence. Believe it or not, that position, there are some people who still maintain their position. I just realized that Jared Gandhi and his students, this is their position, that it was a dream sequence. The second one is that he actually made the journey physically up to Bentul Mahdas, which means he went to Jerusalem. But from there on, the entire trip into heaven and, and beyond are all spiritual. So, and the third, and which is actually a majority position among the Sahaba and among Muslims, especially Sunni Muslims, the majority position is that he made the entire trip awake, it was not a dream, and he made it in spirit and body. So there was both body and a spiritual uh, travel. There are, it is very interesting, I found that the way we use the Quran is, is quite, mashallah, interesting. The people who claim that this is a dream sequence, and not reality, 
use the 68th ayah of Surah Isra. This is what it says, Bismillah Rahmani Rahim. So they say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we did not make this vision which we showed you except as a trial or a fitna for people. So they use this word, ru'iyya, in this ayah to argue that this was a vision, this was a dream. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that we did not make this vision for you, Muhammad, except as a test for people. But what is interesting is, I mean, this verse actually proves the opposite. Because even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is acknowledging that the journey was a test for people. So he's saying that this journey was made as a test. For example, on the day the Prophet ﷺ narrated this, this story, in the morning, he was in Masjid al-Haram and guess of all, guess who was the first person who heard about this? It was Abu Jahl. was an Indian Muslim who heard about it. He walked in, he saw Rasulullah and said, Mal Jadid, what's up? It's like saying, what's up? What's new? And Prophet said, last night I went to Masjid al-Aqsa and came back at night. And he was a kind of shock. But he was a very clever man. He wanted to instinctively respond, laugh and mock at the Prophet but he thought, if I mock him, then Prophet Sallallahu will deny it. So he wanted the Prophet Sallallahu to tell the story to everybody. So he collected everybody in the haram, Muslims and non-Muslims, everybody, and said, did you hear what Muhammad is saying? And asked Prophet Sallallahu to stand up and tell the story. So the Prophet Sallallahu started telling what happened with him. And obviously lots of people found it very bizarre. They said, how can you say this? How can you say this? So you went to Baitul Maqas, you went to Jerusalem, he said, yes. So one of the things that they did was to test him and ask him to describe how Jerusalem or Baitul Maqdas does. And the Prophet says that I went there, I went there at night, but it, I didn't like, he didn't take a tour or he didn't take a bus tour of Jerusalem to find out you know, what its sites are. How do you describe it? He went there in the night and his focus was more in the mosque and he went up. But he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me a vision of Maqdas, so I could see it right in front of me as if I was standing in front of him. So he answered all the questions accurately. And the descriptions that people were asking him about Jerusalem, he provided this, these descriptions very accurately. And so people were at least convinced that he must have been, to, if not this time, sometime else. That is one of the smaller miracles that is associated with Miraj. This vision that the Prophet saw of Baitul Maqdas alive in the morning while he's speaking about it in Masjid al -Tan. Some people went and spoke with Abu Bakr so at the time and said, did you hear what your friend is saying? He's saying that he went and came back. And Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, responded by saying, if he's saying that, then he did it. And since that day, he's became a Siddiq. Since that day, he's been called Abu Bakr Siddiq because he believed in Prophet ﷺ, even this story. Interestingly, a certain number of Muslims who were Muslims until that day actually left the faith. So many, some of the Sahaba, I don't know the full number, who were until that moment Muslim, they gave up believing in Islam because they did not believe this story, they thought it was so bizarre. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we have sent you this ruya as a test for your people. There's nothing but fitrah. So this ayah does not prove that it was a dream, on the contrary, it proves the opposite. Because if the Prophet said, I saw this in my dream, why would it be an issue? You can see lots of things. I can tell you a lot of things about me traveling in space uh, in my dreams. I have, I have explored the moon and the Jupiter. So what? Anybody can dream anything. There would have been no fitna, no issue, no disbelief. So the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself testifies that this claim has created a fitna and also the fact that some Muslims actually gave up their faith after listening to the story that the Prophet sallallahu had to say that is more of a testi testimony for me and for a lot of companions. When I first thought of this, I thought only I had figured it out. <laughs> May God forgive me. But then I looked at it and this is exactly what Qadi Ayah said. If that was the case, then 
if it was a dream, why do people have any problem? And then I, as I read more and more scholars, even Kasi also says this, and lots of other scholars have said, if it was a dream, nobody would have had it. Your dream would not have been an issue. Abu Jahal would not have even made an issue of making this whole discourse. So how does this begin? The Prophet there are two versions of it. One says that he was sleeping at home, the other says he was sleeping in the masjid. And because the ayah says we took him from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa, I take the other version which says that he was sleeping uh, in that area where we call Hatim now. And he was sleeping there. Uh, Jibril came and woke him up. He actually woke him up with his foot. I was surprised by that. Pushed him up, he, the Prophet got up two times and then went back to sleep. And third time, Jibril literally dragged him out and dragged him out and took him out. And then the Prophet says, Jibril cut me open from here to here. He cut me open. He cut my chest and took my heart out. And he put it in a bow. And then Mikhail, the other angel who was with him, brought Zamzam and they washed my heart three times and filled it with Iman and Yaqeen. <laughs> filled it with Iman and Yaqeen and then he fixed it up all the way and the mark that is left on his shoulders as a result of this is called the, the symbol of prophethood which was there. If you remember, Salman al farisi comes for the first time and requests the Prophet He just keeps trying to walk behind him and finally the Prophet said, do you want to see my show? He says, yes. So he takes his shirt off and when he sees that mark of prophecy, he embraces Islam. Salman al farsi That is the mark, at least according to this hadith, that the Prophet And after this surgery or purification process, Jibreel brings a white animal, which is bigger than a donkey, smaller than a mule. And uh, the Prophet writes on it to to Bajal Maqdas to Jerusalem. He says that every step is as far as the animal can see. And so he travels that fast, he reaches there, and then he ties, there's a hole on the, on the door. The door of Bajal Maqdas is open, the Prophet ties on and steps in. There is an interesting hadith, other than uh, the Prophet Sallallahu many years later sends a messenger to speak to the Byzantine Emperor with a letter. And the Byzantine Emperor reads the letter from the Prophet ﷺ in which the Prophet ﷺ claims that he is a prophet of God. And so the Emperor looks around and he says, we have some businessmen visiting us from Mecca. Let's ask them what they have got to say about this man who claims to be a prophet. And guess who was there for all people? Abu Sufyan was there at that time. So Abu Sufyan comes to the court and Abu Sufyan said, at first I was tempted to say a lot of lies about Prophet Muhammad so that Prophet Muhammad's uh, influence does not extend outside Arabia. And then I realized that if I'm caught telling a lie, then I will lose my credibility in future if I'm exposed. So he said, I wanted to discredit the Prophet but also not lie. So he decided to tell him, well, yes, I know of this man. He claims that he went from Battle Haram to Battle Maqdas in one night and came back. And everybody in the court is amused and they are laughing, etc. Except the main rabbi in the court who was not the main priest, who happened to be the priest of Battle Maqdas. So the emperor asked him, what have you got to say? He says, I remember that night. And everybody in the court is very stunned. He said, what do you mean you remember that night? He said, I remember when this happened because I, the person, me and my students locked the doors of Baitul Maqdas every night. That night we simply could not shut the door. Now it's not as if they had locked the door, Jibreel would not have opened it, okay? But this, this is the testimony I think God was eliciting. That's why this episode happened. So this priest is saying that finally we thought that maybe some prophet is going to visit us, maybe some angel is going to visit this holy place. So we left that thing open and in the morning we realized that some animal was tied outside. So I testify that, that this, at least this much part he was able to testify. 
So there are all these narrations which are from outside uh, Islamic tradition, so to speak, which also partially authenticate this message. So the Prophet ﷺ reaches it. Now there are two versions of it. One version is that he just prays to Rakat, the, field, the greeting for the mosque, and then he's taken up on God. The other version is that here he meets all other prophets and he leads them in Salah. Now, with this version, there is a logical question. If he has met them, then when he goes up in heaven, why is he reintroduced to these prophets? Because he's already just met them, right? So the other version is probably what I like, because he does not lead them in prayer, he is taken straight up into the heaven. With, this is the mirage, he rises up, and Jibreel alayhi salam knocks on the door of the first heaven and the voice comes in from outside. Who is there? He says, Assalamu alaikum, this is Jibreel. Do you have somebody with you? He says, this is Muhammad Rasulullah. And so the angel say, oh, has his mission already begun? He said, yes, his mission has already begun. They open the door and they meet Adam alayhi salam, the first time. Uh, and Adam alayhi salam says, Assalamu alaikum, and then the Prophet Jibril introduces and says, this is Muhammad. And then Prophet says, who is he? And says, this is your father, Adam. It is very interesting that the Prophet refers to Adam and Ibrahim as father and to all the other prophets as brothers. Which is very interesting. And he refers to Isa -Islam, and actually as my cousin. And Musa as brother. Ibrahim and Adam as father. Joseph. Uh, also, he refers to him as my cousin. And so they go up. Uh, Adam says he is so young. Obviously, Adam was 900 years old, 970. So he looks at the Prophet, who's probably varying estimates between 42 and 51 at this time. So then they go up to the second, the same process of introduction, and the second heaven he meets. Isa and Yusuf, Joseph, and John, sorry, Yahya, and he says, these are your cousins, and they greet you. Then he goes to the third heaven. And in the third heaven, he meets Yusuf and has the same introduction. Then he goes to the fourth heaven. And this is very interesting to me, that in the fourth heaven is Idris. Idris uh, uh, the Quran In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to Idris, a couple of times. One he says that he was a truthful man and a prophet at the other place he says we raised him to a high place. Uh, so this is the fourth heaven. That is what he's referring to. I have raised him so high that he is in the fourth heaven. He's on a higher plateau than even Jesus. Uh, uh, people have tried to figure him out. They believe that he is who the Bible, etc., refers to as Enoch. This is one prophet we know very little about in Islamic traditions, except that he lived during the generation of Adam, so probably 600 years after Adam, al Islam, Idris shows up. And according to Muslim tradition, he was the first human being to make clothes. The way clothes were made was by Idris, al Islam, but he was also an interpreter. So Idris, he's come from Das. Arabic word does to lesson, so he was an interpreter, a teacher. So maybe he was teaching what was revealed through early prophets. Then they go to the fifth heaven. In the fifth heaven, they meet Harun. And in the sixth heaven, they meet Musa. Islam. And Musa Islam looks at him and he's also amazed that he is so young. And after the introduction, as the Prophet Wasallam is moving away, they actually turn around and see Musa starts crying. And uh, the Prophet asked Jibreel, why is he crying? And Musa responds by saying, I can't believe that there will be more followers of this young man in heaven than my followers. This is what the Prophet said. I can't believe that there will be more followers of this young man in heaven than my followers. And then he goes to the seventh heaven where, now at the seventh heaven is where all the action there is nothing higher than the seventh heaven, and there he meets lots of interesting things. There are three important things that happen in the seventh heaven. Number one, he, meet, he sees what is called as Baitul Mahmur. Baitul Mahmur is, according to Islamic tradition, right on top of 
uh, the car. But I don't know how that makes sense because if there are only two things, everything is on top of the other, right? A straight line. Nevertheless, one way to think of Baitul Mahmur is it is the haram of the heavens. So it is the Kaaba of the heavens. So the Kaaba of the earth is Baitul Haram and the Kaaba of the heavens is Baitul Mahmur. Uh, the Prophet sees literally thousands of angels going into it. And Jibreel tells him that every day 70,000 angels visit this and they never visit ever again. So angels are allowed only one Hajj or Umrah, whatever it means, going to Baitul Mahmur. Only once in the entire creation, the entire time they get. And so it tells you how many angels are there. I think that's the point of this. 70,000, 77, 72, these are just the Quranic way of saying many, many large numbers, etc. But sitting by Baitul Mahmur is Ibrahim with his back. Now in some traditions, now I'm going to deviate from the main script. This is a Sufi tradition which says, I don't know whether you have seen this, maybe you've seen it in India and Pakistan. Whenever people say the name of Prophet Sallallahu people will do like this. Have you, have you seen people do this? They will kiss their nails and then they will kiss their eyes. Well, one weak tradition says that the Prophet Sallallahu saw Ibrahim sitting there and doing this, kissing his nails. And so they were introduced and said, this is your father, Ibrahim, and Ibrahim meets with him. And then the Prophet sees that in his nails, Ibrahim al-Islam can see the face of Muhammad. So that is why he was kissing his thumbs and touching them to his eyes. Wallahu okay. alam. So, okay, this is, this, this Salafi Muslim has a weak uh, is not of this tradition. But it's an important tradition. It has been practicing. You kiss your thumbs every time you think. It is like sending a physical durud. Instead of saying, Allahumma salam, you just kiss your thumbs. It's like a physical, especially for people who are illiterate, new Muslims, this is an easy way of teaching them a durud. Just think of the Prophet and kiss your thumbs. Now, beyond the battle of Mahmur is this tree called Siddhat al <coughs> You heard uh, Sheikh Isham recite in the Quran, it is in the Quran, so the Nazar will mention it's a fabulous tree, it's beautiful. At this tree, Jibril stops. Jibril stops and says, I cannot go beyond this point. If I go beyond this point, I will burn and die and I'll be finished. This is the limit. This is what the Intihai, this is the limit of creation beyond it. Literally, I understand it's the end of space and time. This is the end of space and time. Only you, Muhammad sallallahu you can go beyond. Even I, who has been the closest, cannot go beyond this point. Now, there is a lot of debate from here on whether Prophet sallallahu actually saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or did not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. And uh, if you look at the ayahs of Surah Al-Najm, which I will discuss uh, shortly, Jibril al-Islam shows his real self to, to the Prophet ﷺ at this point. Again, this is the second time in his life. The first time was after the first revelation, the Prophet ﷺ goes home and he buried there for many months. The first revelation was the Quran, the second hour about Mudassa, Ya Ayyuha The Prophet ﷺ started questioning himself. He started feeling that did I actually have this experience? Am I going crazy? Am I mad? Am I losing my mind? So according to Nauzubillah, some traditions, he actually goes back up and wants to jump and die. And that's when Jibril shows up and says, you know what, you did see me, this is true, now I will show you my tours. So the ayah in Surah Al-Najam is talking about Asaf, about the sky, is the Prophet Sallallahu beholding Jibreel, wherever he saw, in every direction he could see Jibreel. Because Jibreel wanted to convince the Prophet that he is a Prophet indeed. I mean, he wanted to show him something absolutely miraculous. Don't doubt what happened to you the first time. This is true. And that's where you see Jibreel. That is what the Quran is wrestling to. So the second time is at the Siddhartha Muntaha that he shows us. I don't understand why. You are now on seventh heaven, there is no need to doubt anything. You've already spoken to Ibrahim al Islam. Also. So, I find this explanation less convincing uh, in the tradition. But beyond this, there is no doubt among 
all Muslims, regardless of what, as long as they are Muslims, they believe that Prophet ﷺ had a conversation, had a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you all know the hadith about how we got our five prayers, but I will say that. But before that, I'm going to again move a little away from Orthodox and share with you a Sufi understanding of what happened. Now the puzzle is, you are meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether you see him or not is a different issue. But how will you greet the, your Lord? I mean, what would you say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Will you say, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Allah? I mean, how can you say, Oh Allah, may Allah have peace upon you? May Allah protect you? I mean, you can't say that, right? So the Prophet finds another way of greeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what he says. He says, <laughs> This is what Allah, the Prophet tells Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I bring to you greetings. I bring to you a tayyat lillahi for Allah, salawat and tayyibat. All nice things are for Allah. And then the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to the Prophet. Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was saying and Assalamu alaikum. Salam to you. Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And then the Prophet sallallahu responds by saying, Assalamu alaikum wa ala ibadillahi salim. And may peace be upon us. He's responding to Allah's salam by saying, may peace be upon us. Assalamu alaikum. And uh, uh, Muslim scholars etc. said that we are eternally grateful for the Prophet because he included us in that conversation. He's saying that may Allah's blessings be upon us. Assalamu alayna. And then, Ibadillah uh, is salihin, those who are your servants, who are righteous. And, and interpretations are very generous. You don't have to be a righteous servant, even if you're on the path of righteousness. Even in your heart, if there's one little desire to be righteous, you are included. Assalamu alayna. Wa ala ibadillah is salihin. Now while this conversation is going on, guess who is listening to this? The angels are listening to this entire conversation between Allah and His Messenger. And they all then say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. Indeed, we testify that there is no God but Allah. And we also testify that Muhammad is your servant and he is your Messenger. And this greeting is what we pray in our salah, when we sit down and we read at Tahiyatulillahi, after every two rakahs and after every four rakahs, this is where it is, this is where it comes from. And of course there are other people who say that the way the Prophet gave this to us is one day he turns around and looks at Ibn Masih. Some of the companions of the Prophet are considered scholars, like Ibn Abbas. Ibn Masud. Ibn Masud is very, very special because one day Prophet embraced him publicly and prayed with his chest, touching <coughs> Masud's chest, and said, Ya Allah, give Ibn Masud the knowledge of the Quran. You know, you must have heard in Islamic tradition that knowledge goes from chest to chest, chest to chest. Sina ba Sina, you must have heard this phrase, right? This is from this hadith, where the Prophet embraces Ibn Masud and says, Ya Allah, give him the knowledge. So when Ibn Masud says anything in the traditions, take it very, very seriously. So the Prophet turns around and tells Ibn Masud, give me your hands, Ibn Masud, and I will teach you something without which the prayer will not be blessed. And this is it. He teaches him. So all Muslims accept this part. What they don't accept is what is the origin of this. And this is this is what the Sufis say that this is the beginning of the conversation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, the Prophet. According to Ibn Abbas account, this is what then the Prophet says, Ya Allah, you made Ibrahim your friend. You spoke to Musa. You made Isa give perform miracles. What about me? What is there for me, Ya Rasulullah? Ya Allah? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to him and says, I gave you what I did not give anybody, which is Surah Fatiha, the seven most 
often repeated ayahs in the Quran. I gave you Fatiha, I did not give Fatiha to anybody else. I'm going to give you another gift, which are the last three ayahs, 284, 285, 286 of Surah Baqarah. Okay. That is a beautiful ayah. We pray them in our dua, etc. But what I like most about it is that Allah Ta'ala does not burden the soul beyond its capacity. If Allah Ta'ala gives you the burden, He also gives you the soul to bear that burden. And the third thing, this is very important, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, and the third gift that I'm giving you, which I have not given others, is that your Ummah are forgiven even major sins. Even major sins are forgiven to the Ummah of Rasulullah as long as they do not commit shirk. As long as they do not associate any partners with God, even major sins are forgiven. After that, there is a reference in Surah Al Najm that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala manifests Himself to the Prophet. The Prophet sees Him. The Prophet and and the ayah in the Quran is beautiful. It says that neither did his eyes waver, nor did they transgress. It's very interesting. He did not show curiosity. He did not become curious about Allah. And he did not shy away either. His eyes did not transgress. And his eyes did not wear. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this state of eye contact, he would say, revealed to him what he revealed to him. And we don't know what that was. So it's in the Quran, more than once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he revealed to his servant what he revealed. The Prophet when he was asked about this, he said, I do not want, I am told not to share this with you, so I cannot share with you what those revelations were. And after this moment, after this moment, uh, not at this moment you could clearly see is the peak in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Because now he is like Ibrahim, he is a friend of Allah because Allah says, You are my friend. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke several times, at least two times, to Musa, but from behind a veil. He has not spoken in a very intimate conversation with Rasulullah. But now he has also given him a vision that no one has had. He has been given a vision that no one has had. And then after this, he gives him the ultimate gift, which is prayers when he says for your ummah 50 obligatory prayers per day and the Prophet ﷺ returns and as he's coming back of course it had to be Musa who asked the question and said hey, what did you get he said I got 50 prayers he said ah that's not gonna work I know these people on planet earth very well <laughs> and I have lots of experience with these people go back 50 is too much so he goes back and then it is reduced by 10 and he comes back and says it's 40, he says, Musa says, no, I'm not going to work, go back. And so Musa sends him back several times and then he comes back and uh, says, how many? Five. He said, they are not going to pray five times, go back. Make it once a day. Now Rasulullah says, I'm shy, I, I mean, how many times can I go back? I'm not going to go back. Five is fine. At that time they hear a voice where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have ordained to you what I have ordained, is five. And I have reduced your burden, which is from fifty to five. And I will count each prayer as ten prayers. So I mean this is a fabulous deal, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Okay, I want you to pray fifty times, but you are asked to reduce it, so I have reduced your burden. So pray five times, but I will count it as ten times. So pray five times, but I will count it as fifty times, because each prayer will be counted as ten prayers. So from God's point of view, He gets His fifty, and we get our reduction. And this is a very interesting conversation between Musa and uh, the Prophet ﷺ. And then the Prophet ﷺ returns back to Bayt al with all the Prophets. And now, the Prophet actually says, I saw all of them, and he names Prophets who he did not name in the heaven trip. So he names Sulaiman, he names Nuh, who he did, does not mention 
when he was traveling in the heavens. So they were also there with him. And the Prophet leads them in prayer for two rakas. And after the prayer is over, Jibril brings a plate or a tray with a glass of wine and a glass of milk to the Prophet The Prophet chooses to drink milk and not wine. And uh, a lot of people are saying, oh my God, I wish he had picked the other one. <laughs> <laughs> but he picked milk and not wine. And Jibreel says something very interesting. He says, uh, Yeah, Muhammad, you have picked fitrah. He said, You have chosen fitrah. He said, You have chosen something which is natural to us, which is milk. You know, we are nurtured by milk. That is what children drink when they are born. And he also said that if you had made the other choice, your Ummah would have been doomed. If the Prophet had chosen wine, then the Ummah would. I, I, I can believe that, that the Ummah would really have been doomed if. Now, coming back to this issue of whether the Prophet, where are my notes? Whether the Prophet actually saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not is an interesting thing. Among the companions and early scholars, it was a majority opinion that he did see Allah. Okay, you must keep this in mind. It is a majority opinion that he saw Allah Subhanahu There are three positions. One position is that he did not see God. There is a question that Abu Dhabi asks him, say, Ya Rasulullah, have you seen God? And he says, according to Abu Dhabi, how could I see him? He was behind a veil of light. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself as Nuru Samarati wa he is light, so he is light behind light. So the Prophet says, how could I have seen him? He, he was behind light. That is one tradition. So those who accept this tradition from, the, from, uh, from Abu Dhar say he did not see him. Then there is another tradition uh, where the Prophet does respond to it. Ibn Abbas has three or four traditions. Some of them he says, very simply, I saw my Lord, as simple as that. Prophet just said it, I saw my Lord. In the other place he says, I saw my Lord with my heart. I saw my Lord with my heart. And there is this, this tradition which says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be contained by this entire universe. This Allah subhanahu wa is greater than this creation. But but he can be contained in a believer's heart. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too great to, to be contained in anything that is in creation, but he can be contained in the believer's heart. So they say this is what the reference to is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Muslims a branch of the companions and those who follow them believe that the Prophet saw with his heart. I don't know what that means, saw so, with his heart. So the dispute is on certain ayahs. For example, if you go to Surah Al-Najam, which has a longer description of, uh, of the journey of Isra, uh, the, the chapter of Isra, from, chap from ayah 1 till ayah 19, it's important. By the way, 20, 21, 22 are those verses which are controversial and discussed as satanic verses, etc. We'll talk about it some other day. But this ayah, which is the 13th ayah in Surah Al Najam, he certainly saw him in another descent. The fact that it says he certainly saw him in another descent leaves a lot of companions to believe that. All that the Prophet saw there was Jibreel. But when I read this ayah, which is the 18th ayah of Surah Al Najam, uh, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Lakat ra'a min ayati rabbihi al kubra. He saw the greatest of signs of his Lord. With all due respect, to Angel Gabriel, he is not the greatest sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The creation is, in my opinion, a greater sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Jibreel is one element of Allah's creation. Allah created Jibreel, He created the prophets, He created the heavens and the earth. 
So, so one part of it cannot be greater than the whole. So the greatest of Allah's creation is creation itself. Time and space and these things. And the Prophet himself is perhaps the greater sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than Jibreel. And the whole point of taking him all the way up there to show Jibreel at the end of it is kind of, you know, anti-connect. Uh, Jibril, you could see, Jibril was his buddy for 23 years, he met him so many times, talked to him. So it's not very convincing to me that it is. And I'll tell you why some of the companions who accepted that they saw Jibril, why they accepted it. Because it was a fatwa from Abdul Mawini and Aisha. But if you go further down, it says very clearly, the sight of Prophet Sallallahu did not swerve, nor did it transgress. He certainly saw the greatest of his signs. And then he says, he revealed to his servant what he revealed. Now these three things, he revealed to his servant what is revealed. Jibreel, Prophet ﷺ is not Jibreel's servant. The Prophet ﷺ is the servant of only one, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not Abdihi, the word Abdihi does not apply to Jibreel, it applies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aisha, based on another ayah, let me see if I can find it for you. She says, oh, you should have it somewhere, yeah? she says basically, she says that no human being can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the conversation with Musa. God says, if you, you can't see me, well, look at the mountain. If the mountain can see me, then maybe you can see and the mountain is completely crushed. So the ayah she decides is from Surah Al-Anam, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, La tudrikuhu al-absar wa huwa so what this ayah says is that vision perceives him not. No vision can perceive him, but he perceives all vision. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Latif and Qabir. I told you that there is a reason why he picks his uh, particular attributes. Here he's saying he's so subtle, he's Latif. He is so subtle that no vision can come and encompass him. <coughs> But he is also Khabir, he knows everything so he can encompass everything. Now, Aisha uses this ayah to say that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says no vision can encompass him, that is proof that even Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa could not have seen him. That is her argument. But let me give you a, a, do a thought experiment with me. Imagine that you're standing in front of the Great Wall of China. Can you encompass the whole thing? You cannot. Can you see? Yes. So you could say, I saw maybe 500 bricks as part of the wall. I saw a part of it. I cannot comprehend the whole wall which is transferred. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is infinite. Nobody but He can see Himself fully. And nobody but He can see Himself fully. So the Prophet sallallahu could have seen one of His greatest signs, one of His attributes, one of His manifestations, tajalli, but not the entire thing. So yes, the Prophet sallallahu Nobody can. Even in the life after hereafter, we will never be able to comprehend him in his entirety. It is only in the state of fana when we become one with him that we will see with his eyes, then we can see. There is this famous hadith when I love my servant, he sees with my eyes. It is only then when we will be able to see. But he loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Maybe Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala made him see that. Plus this whole surgery part. Remember in the beginning that his heart was purified? I mean, that alone tells us that the Prophet ﷺ is no more like an ordinary human being. He is not any more like us. Plus, his travel through, through these heavens physically are no more like us anymore. So the fact that all of us as human beings cannot see does not, I think, in my opinion, apply to the Prophet ﷺ. And so that is why it's very important. So now what does it mean if we accept the fact that he did see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It means two things. Remember the hadith of Ihsan when Jibreel asked what is Ihsan? Prophet sallallahu to worship Allah as if you see him. The Prophet sallallahu entire life after Miraj was in a state of Ihsan. Because when he was doing ibadah, it was as if he was seeing Allah, because he had indeed seen him. You and I can only try to imagine, and it's impossible to imagine God, unless 
the time you imagine, and that's why people created idols, because of the difficulty of imagining God. But for, for the Prophet it is not difficult because he's in this perpetual state of Islam, because he is seen. The other part is this, this idea of yaqeen. You know, we have ilm al yaqeen, that is, we learn things from books. A lot of us Muslims are Muslims by virtue of reading books. So we have faith in things because we say, oh, it's in the Bukhari, oh, it's in the Quran. This is Ilm al-Yaqeen. And then we have something called Ayn al-Yaqeen. That you see things, and then you have belief in it. And then the final Yaqeen, Haqq al-Yaqeen, which is the truth. The ultimate belief that comes from experience. So what happened with Prophet Sallallahu once he went beyond Baitul Mahmur, he is in this intimate state with God. He's having a conversation with God. He's having a vision of God. He is in what we would call as haqq al yaqeen He has haqq al yaqeen So the purpose of Miraj was to provide Prophet with haqq al yaqeen just as the vision of uh, heavens and the earth provided Ayn al yaqeen to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And so that is the purpose of Miraj. Miraj is the metaphor for the spiritual life of human beings. We as believers are seeking that sign. For some people, the vision of Prophet in the dream itself is a mirage. You, that is your individual mirage. Because the Prophet himself said that uh, shaitan cannot come in my form in your dream. So if you see me in my dreams, you have indeed seen me. So that's like a true vision of the Prophet. For some that is a mirage. For others, you can have other divine experiences. And these divine experiences are gifts. These spiritual experiences are gifts from God for the love that you show to us, that comes from regular prayer, fasting, praying, dim muddits, doing ibadahs. So that is the message of Miraj. This is what happened. This is the ultimate spiritual experience. The Miraj is not just the victory of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's the victory of all of humanity. It is the ultimate connection between human beings and God. That the distance between God and believers was less than that of two poems. I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept our efforts tonight. He will give us more knowledge, more understanding, and in our efforts to come nearer to Him, to have greater love for Him. He will give us, at some point in our lives, a taste of our own individual mirages, inshallah.